Good morning. Let's prepare to come and hear what God has to say to us from Luke chapter 12 this morning. So let me just pray before I start to read. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, the Bible, and we thank you for what's written there. We know that it's sharper than two, any two-edged sword to pierce to the very marrow of our bones. Please open our hearts to hear what you would have us hear today as you speak to us through the Bible. And we ask it in Jesus' name, please. Amen. The parable of the rich fool and teaching about money and possessions. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, What should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, My friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. You will die this very night. Who then will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Then in turning to his disciples, Jesus said, This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear, for life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for God feeds them. And you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world, but your Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your Father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're in a topical series and uh, you might remember back to last week where we talked about music and worshipping God. Uh, well, today, it's, I drew the short straw and I get to speak to you about money. So, um, thank you to the wardens and others who have asked me to speak about money. Um, I've got lots of sort of questions going around the back of the skull about why people would want to hear about money. Perhaps um, a mature, older Christian would say, well, we were taught about money and we want to see the younger members of our congregation or the newer members of our congregation understanding how God sees such a thing 
Or you might have a, a younger person that says, you know, I've been brought up well or by parents, but I want to know as a child of God, you know, how do I order my life? How do I manage my time and my money and my friendships in a way that reflects the fact that I am God's? I wonder if you could, uh, if you could echo this proverb from Proverbs chapter 30. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs or give me only my daily bread. Uh, and that's a proverb that we echo in the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? Give me this day my daily bread. So this morning, God is speaking to us about money. And let me just say in preparing this sermon uh, that I could have very easily prepared an eight-week series because there is so much material in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in Jesus' teaching, and in the New Testament church. Um, and I, let me also say, you can all relax, because there's not going to be a financial appeal at the end of this message, okay? You can just listen, okay, and just reflect, that's all there is riding on this. Um, but I would like to give you a little bit of an introduction to where my thoughts have gone, um, and uh, I tried to prepare something that would be helpful for someone hearing about money for the first time in a church, as well as putting something in there for those of us who have travelled quite a long way with the Lord, and um, many of our resources have been poured into the Kingdom of God. So my outline is this. We want to spend some. If we go to that next slide, yep. We want to spend it, right? We want to save it, and we want to give it. Does that pretty much sum up what we do with money, right? We spend it, we save it, and we give it. And because I'm an engineer, I can't not put everything into a chart. So on the next slide, you can see there's a chart. It actually hasn't got any labels, but I think in a way, this kind of reflects the ideal kind of use of money, right? So the reality is life costs a lot, doesn't it? Petrol costs a lot. So the blue is uh, meant to represent just how we go through life and most of our resources are used up just getting by, right? Just paying the bills and doing the things we need to do. And then the yellow and the red are there to reflect perhaps an opportunity to save along the way. And you might think, well, I, there's no way I could save that proportion of my income, but you know, wouldn't that be nice? And then the red um, can reflect an opportunity for giving. Um, and to be giving towards the needs of others, to giving towards the, the church, giving towards the kingdom and kingdom projects all around the world. So there's a giving colour. And um, actually, let me just give you a personal confession. That's not how it started with me and that's something that I aspire to. So how it started with me and for the first many years of my childhood, do you think back to your childhood? Well, for me, I was a saver. Yes, I was. I might have only got 20 cents a week of pocket money, but I put all of that 20 cents in the bank. I did, I pleased my parents, and I was a model firstborn son, right? And by the time I got to about 13, my parents didn't remember to give me my weekly pocket money too often, and I had about, um, I had about $20 in the bank, yeah? And pretty much that's all that ever happened. I didn't give anything away, and I very rarely spent that spent money, right? It went straight into the piggy bank and it went straight from the piggy bank to the savings account that mum and dad opened. And in their eyes, I was a model child. But really, 13 bucks wasn't that much use to me later on in life. If you get 20 bucks, probably would have been better if I'd actually learnt to spend, right? Probably would have been better if I'd actually learnt to give along the way. But I learnt to save. So that's my confession. Okay. Now, um, I just do want to acknowledge that there are different stages of life. Some people here might be retired and um, you might not actually have much of an income these days. And so we just acknowledge that for you, saving might not be a really big opportunity um, and giving might be quite sacrificial. Um, and so at all different stages of life, um, the hectic ones where you've got kids running around um, the, the young ones where, you, where you're studying and using up a lot of your income just to survive. Lots of different stages of life. 
But why don't we go to what Jesus says here in Luke 12 and see if it resonates for us. Someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. And um, but these verses will appear up on the screen as I go through. And I don't know, you might have already hit a problem in life like this, where you feel perhaps trapped by money, or you could have a family issue about money, or a legal problem, or maybe someone scammed from you, or stole from you in some way. And then money becomes an issue, doesn't it, for us? There's a real life problem before us. And what are we going to do? Are we going to fight, right? Because sometimes you might be able to fight about this issue and maybe get a better income or maybe actually fighting will make you feel quite miserable. Have you ever been trapped in that kind of cycle where you're really uptight about an injustice, right? And you're fighting the injustice but it feels like it takes over your whole life. Um, or what if, what if you don't fight? Would you, would you also feel miserable about not having kind of stuck up for what is right and true and fair? So life is complex, isn't it? So let's see what Jesus does here. And what we find is that he doesn't interfere with these family decisions. Jesus replied on the next slide, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? A very interesting thing that Jesus didn't get involved in this family's dynamics. But then he says something I think that cuts closer to the heart. He says, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Uh, isn't that rather hopeful, don't you think, actually? A little bit of a warning that there's pain ahead if we chase after money and a little bit of hope, in fact, that we can have a rich and full life whether we do or don't own a lot. So your life and your success cannot be measured by money or houses or cars or even motorbikes, right, Anna? So listen to this story that Jesus told. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't even have room for all my crops. So he goes, I know, I'll tear down my barns, I'll build big barns, then I'll have room to store all my wheat and other goods. Is this bloke a spender, a saver, or a giver? Yep, he's a saver, isn't he? And I'll sit back and I'll say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. So, he kind of knows how to spend on himself, doesn't he? Yeah? I don't know um, whether you agree with his spending priorities, but his philosophy is this. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. So, he has enough for his needs, he has enough for a whole lot of fun, he has enough for the rest of his life. Everything's looking great. It's kind of like the Australian dream, isn't it? Well, I think a lot of Aussies would aspire to this sort of situation. So is this man wise or foolish? What do you reckon? The trouble is, you know how the story ends, don't you? So why am I asking rhetorical questions? Now remember, we said that Jesus is teaching us to spend, to save and to give. Which one did the farmer forget? Yeah, so you guys... Are you could almost be preaching this sermon. You really don't need me. When we remember back to the beginning, though, we remember that Jesus has already said life cannot be measured by how much money we have. And this becomes obvious in the farmer's story. Because as we come to the end of this story, God says to him, You fool, you will die this very night, then... Who will get everything you worked for? Another rhetorical question. So let's answer that. Who will get everything he worked for? What's the answer? Somebody else, not him, right? So, and the big conclusion that Jesus has for us, 
Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. The farmer does not end his life. He does not go to his grave as a rich person. He goes to his grave with nothing. That's confronting, isn't it? I don't think your average Aussie really wants to hear that. But we have a clue, an important clue here, about another alternative. A person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. So there is a way to die rich, right? And then to live rich, let me suggest. Because in the end, earthly wealth gives us a big fat zero. And the way to finish life rich is to have a rich relationship with God. Let's think about what this means now. And I hope that you're actually not feeling annoyed with me yet. I, I, I'll work on that. But let's think through those three different ways of using money that we identified at the beginning, the spending and the saving and the giving. And so we'll start with spending. And let's think, as Christians and drawing on the wider Bible, how would we learn, as a disciple of Jesus, to spend? How do we learn to spend? Well, God is generous, right? That's a really fundamental thing about our great God. God promises to meet our needs. As we heard in the Bible, like the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, God will provide. And that is a promise. And God is so generous, he gives us a little more than we need. Isn't it wonderful? Like, what a grace-filled, beautiful faith we have. He gives us a little more than we need. We can actually engage in some fun stuff in this life. It's okay. We can enjoy sport. Ian, you're okay this time. And art and food and travel. And isn't, isn't life beautiful? Like you can walk around with a, you can buy yourself a camera with a phone and you go around taking pictures of beautiful stuff and share it with your friend. And like there's so many good things in this world, right? And it's okay. It, even if you don't really need it, it's okay. God is generous. And I reckon that this is a reason to avoid those really legalistic interpretations of wealth, your really frugal ideas. Every last dollar doesn't need to be accounted for and we can go beyond mere needs and we can do that because of the character of God and because his covenant of grace is with us. But then on the other hand, that second point there about having self-control, we need to hear that too, don't we? Plenty of Biblical examples cautioning us against excessive self-indulgence from Eli the fat priest, remember that bloke, through the New Testament letters warning us, things like, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame, right? We, there are excesses to be avoided. Their mind is set on earthly things, we are warned. Don't be like that. And so for us, somewhere between extravagance and restraint, there's, some, there's a sweet spot, right? There's a good place to be. And this, in a few words, is how to spend. And I hope that you're excited and grateful to our good God um, who is generous um, and who trusts us with wealth. But the second, the second thing I want to talk about is, is, as disciples of Jesus, learning to save. And this one really is based on the wisdom teaching of the Bible. If you, if you think, get yourself into that Proverbs headset, right? Where we're actually thinking a bit more widely and a bit more logically about how we can be in this world. And um, the Bible teaches us to plan ahead and to be a bit self-sufficient and to prepare for hard times, right? To have a little emergency fund sitting there somewhere. How do we think about saving? Well, saving gives you capacity, doesn't it? It's a nice thing to have a little bit of a backstop so that 
you can act when you need to. A little bit like having batteries charged in your electric grill, right? No point having the electric grill if you go to use it and the battery's flat. Um, if your phone or your car or your house have a battery, you understand the point of saving that electrical charge up. And in Luke 14, which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Or in Proverbs 10, he who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. So saving is viewed by the Bible as a good thing, right? This is not a proverb that says never save, always have your bank account as close to zero as you possibly can. That would be foolish, wouldn't it? But too much saving, excessive saving, is a lost opportunity, isn't it? Don't be like the farmer who lays up treasures on earth, but rather lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. And so as we learn to save, maybe moderation would be a good word for that. We want to be wise and build our capacity for saving and yet not hoard wealth. And these are the sort of healthy boundaries for us as Jesus' disciples as we think about saving. Now, I won't do this to you, but if I asked for a show of hands, who thinks they've saved too much? That would be revealing, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, or if I actually asked you who's got zero savings behind them, that would be revealing. And I'm not going to put anyone on the spot by asking that. But there's some, there's some good guidelines in God's word for that one. And then the third point is about giving it away. Learn to give it away as disciples of Jesus. How can we be rich towards God? Um, because God wants us to care about the needs of our family, of our neighbours, of our friends, of the church, of the kingdom of God. He wants people everywhere to know and love him. And so I've got just three words um, to guide us about giving. I could have come up with a lot more, but I had to be strict and cut down. And the first one I wanted to share with you is about joy. There is a joy to giving. And he, Jesus, um, well, I chose one passage to back me up with this joy one. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So I, I, that's a good thing to bear in mind, isn't it? I, I, I get sad when I hear about people who, who give away big chunks of their money under duress, right, because they feel they have to out of guilt or some reason, or some negative reason like that, when actually maybe they should be given a whole lot less but give it with joy. Investment. Um, giving is an investment in something really important. And um, here in Luke 16, Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And so there's the idea that we can actually use the resources that God's given us for something far more important, for relationships, for relationships of eternal value, right? And so this guides me in my thinking. I always want to give a little bit towards practical needs hungry people and, you know, emergencies around the world. But I actually want, I prefer to give something where people are in need and I can build them up in the kingdom, right? Where there's a gospel connection or perhaps where their local church has stood up and is seeking to build relationships as they minister into a community of need. And the third one there is pleasing God alone. You see, we don't, give to get recognition like people in the world do the big companies you know who want their name and logo on the sports field every time their football team plays right we're not like that 
Jesus says in Matthew 6, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So um, I think we can go on to the last slide now. Thanks, Catherine. And um, I hope that you've enjoyed this little introduction um, to our use of money as Christians and as disciples of Jesus. And I'd just like to sum up by saying something about us and something about God. And so really, I think for us, our giving reflects our faith right it reflects our faith and our trust in God and it reflects how we receive the grace and the generosity of God and it reflects an overflowing of joy and the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts right faith grace and joy but our giving is actually centered in the character of God too and there we see God's providence right his generous provision to us we see God's wisdom and we see the love of God as we spend his resources, save his resources and give them away. So I hope that that's it. That's my message on, on money. I hope you're encouraged. I hope you're a little bit excited about the opportunity that God has entrusted to you. I'm going to pray and um, then I want to actually do a notice if that's all right. So let's just pray now. Heavenly Father, please do your work in our lives, in our minds and hearts, in our wallets, in our diaries and among our relationships. We pray uh, that you will teach us how to live as your disciples, that you will provide richly for our needs that your love may overflow in acts of kindness and love towards one another and towards our neighbours. Lord, do your kingdom work among us and we pray that so many of our friends would be saved for eternity and that the greatest joy we would have as we enter into your kingdom would be to see those we love enter in with us. We pray that you would bless the, the money that we receive and use and that you would guide us in doing that faithfully, and that you would grant us joy along the way. In Jesus' name we pray.